started. Um, Jilda, would you mute everybody for right now? And um, my name is Marna Anderson. I work in the U.S. Office of Nonviolent Peace Force. And I have to say, looking at all of your little thumbprints of your pictures and seeing you all here and hearing you welcome is um, a little bit overwhelming and uh, emotional. So I um, want to thank you for being here. Um, we didn't really plan this, but if it's, people are okay with it, I would like to just take um, maybe a moment of silence to just arrive here and be present, uh, fully present here for this next hour. Welcome everybody. And thank you so much for joining uh, on this call. Um, I'm gonna just go through a few logistics. As you know, you're all muted at this point. At the bottom of your screen in the center, you see the chat button. And if you click on that, you can add a comment or a question that everybody will see. And we would like you to use that throughout our presentation and, and through our discussion. The format today, we're gonna to be hearing from our three presenters for a total of about 15 to 20 minutes. And then Mel Duncan, our Director of Advocacy and Outreach, is going to be facilitating a conversation based on the themes that arise from the, your questions and comments during the presentation and throughout. Um, at the conclusion of our session together, or this, this call, in that same bar, you'll receive a link to a survey and we'd like you to fill that out. Just take two minutes, fill that out so we know how we can improve this experience for you in the future and how we can um, make this a forum. We'd like to do this for the next three weeks. And we would like to know what topics um, you would like to discuss and how we can improve this experience for all of you. And before we get started, I also want to acknowledge just a couple people on the call that are, um, been doing a lot of thinking and writing and scholarship on the area of nonviolence um, and uh, peace work for a long time. Um, Rachel Julian, I'm not sure that she's on or not. We invited her. She is a, a nonviolent uh, peace force board member and a professor at Leeds Beckett University and has done some of the um, published quite a bit on the practice of unarmed civilian protection. Terry Wren is the founder of the Center for Peacemaking at Marquette University. And Terry, I saw that you're on the call. And David Hartso, many of you know, uh, co-founder of Nonviolent Peace Force, long life, long, lifelong activist and the founder of World Beyond War. I also noticed that Michael Nagler is on the, on, on the call and he is the director and founder of the Meta Center for Peace in California. Um, I do not want to diminish anybody else's um, work and thinking on the topic of nonviolence and peace. I also saw Madeline McKay, who's done a lot of work through her university um, on our civilian protection, um, but we wanted to, to, to um, let you know some of the people that are on the call that have been doing this work for a long time. We have started, or we are, we've asked Ken um, Buttigan from Pache Bene to start us off by talking about what inspired him to write the article that we hope that you all read, Love and Nonviolence in the Time of the Coronavirus, why we believe it's resonating with people at this, point, at this time. Um, Ken is a strategist for Pache Bene, and he is also a professor at DePaul University in the Peace, Justice, and Conflict Studies program. 
Um, after Ken goes, we'll have Mel Duncan talk a little bit about reframing this period of time that feels so full of fear and war metaphors <laughs> to one of reawakening and transformation. And then Tiffany Easthome, our executive director, will talk a little bit about how this is impacting our programs on the ground. So I'm gonna turn it over now to um, Ken, but again, and thank you so much for being here and participating today. I'm really grateful to be with all of you, uh, agents of, of transformation and change. It's been a privilege of mine to be associated with the Nonviolent Peace Force from the beginning. Veronica Pelikarik, who's on this call also, and I were at the launch in India in 2002 and uh, have been a supporter uh, ever since. So I was asked to reflect on why I wrote um, the piece that I did that uh, many of you may have, may have read. So um, I was thinking back to uh, the, the country of Nicaragua. Uh, I was very involved in organizing the Pledge of Resistance in the 1980s, which was trying to stop our government, the United States government, from waging war in Central America. And uh, in 1972, there was an enormous earthquake in Nicaragua and millions of dollars of aid poured in in the, in the face of that natural disaster. Where did that money go? It went to support, support the oligarchs in the country. It did not trickle down to the, to the poor. And it was that event that catalyzed uh, and, and propelled and advanced the movement for a revolutionary change in, in the country. They chose a violent strategy I think we're in a time when in the face of the uh, coronavirus and what it's challenging us all over the world, we also have an opportunity for revolutionary change. Now that's not to overlook or uh, minimize the, the real suffering uh, that's happening everywhere. And we're in the thick of it and we need to respond to that. Uh, but it's actually that suffering that illuminates the way we don't have a world that's up to handling a crisis like this. In my country, in the United States, we do not have health care for all. Uh, we do not have the uh, life support systems for responding to a tragedy uh, like this. Uh, and that's true in a lot of places around, around the world and it's time for a global response. So first of all, it's the depth of the challenge that we can't overlook anymore. And, but secondly, it's the response we're seeing. We have a renewed sense of the interconnectedness of all, of all life and all, all being. We have um, people not waiting for governments to respond. There is a growing mutual aid movement where people are in neighborhoods and cities and, and countries responding to the needs that are that are coming up in in light of this but this shift this powerful transformative shift that needs to happen will not happen by itself we know that truth passes through three, three phases first it's ridiculed Secondly, it's fiercely and violently opposed. And third, it becomes self-evident. And we have to go through that process. Uh, it may be years, decades, centuries, uh, but that uh, transformation is possible. Another world is possible. And perhaps what we're experiencing now is a kind of rehearsal. Uh, it's also the message. We have to deal with the deep structural violence of poverty, racism, homophobia, military systems, and of course, the existential threat uh, that's happening to, to the planet. All of us on this call, I think, have been experimenting with active, creative, liberating nonviolence. It's going to be the way this transformation will happen in our own lives, in our neighborhoods, in our families, in our communities, in our nations, and, and around the world. As we know, nonviolence is organized love. It's a, it's a constructive force. It's a, an active method. It's a powerful way of, of life. And a uh, tip of the hat to uh, 
Michael Nagler, who just wrote about this. It's we're called to to mainstream uh, nonviolence. We're called to make it um, really the default and the way the way forward. The greatest movement in human history has never happened yet, but it's coming. And we can all be part of that. And uh, I'm uh, most of us know the work of Erica Chenoweth and, and uh, Maria Stefan, whose research, pivotal research, has shown that nonviolent strategies are twice as effective as, as violent ones. One of their conclusions, too, is that. It only requires 3.5% of the population to actually uh, move a campaign forward to success. Uh, in my country, that's about 12 million people. Uh, it's uh, hundreds of millions of people around the planet, but it's possible. It's very possible. We need to really move that forward. I think we can do that. And um, I'm really heartened by the work that you all are doing and that the Nonviolent Peace Force was doing. The last thing I'd say is that, um, at least in my country, uh, there is only a mixed response to trying to create a, um, an end to the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we have, in my country, several governors who have actually ordered uh, uh, sheltering in place, um, only about half the half the country is doing that. And the current president in the United States is saying we're gonna be open for business back in a April uh, 12th, which, is, which most health professionals and analysts say is absurd. And this is gonna be true for the world. The power that we need to ac exert uh, a people power movement to actually create a virtually universal uh, sheltering in place is going to be important. And I, I was um, playing with that a little bit today. And some of us are talking about actually building a movement around this. And I would just share, as, uh, just as a closing, a little um, draft. It's not out there yet, but a draft of a pledge that we could take um, in this country, but around the world. Um, and so if it's OK, I'll just share this just as a way to get us, us thinking about the particular a problem now, which is to stop the spread, which if we do it well, and if it really happens, of course, it means building a movement very, very rapidly, then um, it will be the basis for this longer term uh, transformation that Mel's gonna talk about. So let me, let me just share that if, if that's okay. Staying put, sa saving lives. The pledge to shelter in place during the COVID-19 pandemic. We pledge to shelter in place. We pledge to help safeguard ourselves, our families, our community, our nation, and our world by staying home as long as necessary as determined by health professionals to break the transmission, to lessen the risk of infection, and to end the pandemic. We pledge to support all efforts to provide for the most vulnerable, and to protect all those risking their lives to maintain essential services and medical care. We pledge to shelter in place to save countless lives and to support one another uh, throughout this emergency. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ken. I can uh, remember when David Hartso and I first were writing up the idea of a nonviolent peace force a long time ago now, uh, sitting in David's living room and going over this idea with you. Uh, and so I appreciate being able to work with you for the past two decades. And I look around at, at the different uh, thumb uh, photos of everyone and know that there are so many of us that have been together, either working intentionally or sometimes unintentionally together for a, a very long time. Uh, I think it's important to note that uh, this is an, uh, somewhat of an experiment. We are learning new and different ways of building community, which I think will be critical as we go about the work that Ken just mentioned. Uh, and 
we will mess up. We will get it wrong. I know people yesterday were uh, sharing with me their apprehens apprehensions about technology. Uh, some people are amazed that I'm even able to be on this call uh, all by myself today. But we will mess up on something. Don't worry about it. Uh, Amy is here to help us. And uh, if you mess up too much, we always have next week and we'll learn ways to communicate, as are others. Uh, Peter Yarrow is doing a almost nightly concert from his bedroom uh, that's available um, through YouTube. Uh, Winona LaDuke is uh, showing a uh, video on Saturday night. So there are these ways of community building and movement building that are emerging rather quickly. And as I've listened, and, and some of you knew that I was in isolation for uh, 11 days. I just got a test back last night saying that I, I do not have COVID-19, although I had symptoms. So I had plenty of time uh, to read and sit in uh, this recliner. And I noticed, and also watch television, I, uh, more than I uh, want to admit to you guys, but a constant theme that came through, and this was across the political spectrum in the United States, is that we are at war. I even read uh, the Secretary of the UN, uh, Guterres, Secretary General Guterres yesterday, urged the leaders at the G20 to adopt a wartime plan. Uh, and so there th is this metaphor that keeps getting pushed out there that this is war. I don't think that that necessarily is a metaphor that serves our healing as a planet. I think it's an intentional metaphor to continue to promote the militarization of this planet. So I believe that it's important that we reframe and I uh, simply, first of all, I've been telling people I'm not at war. I, uh, and it's not a war that is going to move us through this crisis. If anything, I am reawakening. I am understanding our connectivity in ways that I haven't understood before. And as Ken alluded to, there are millions of examples of compassion and empathy from the national level to the neighborhood level. For example, uh, in the last few days, we've seen the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain coming forth uh, to the aid of Iran. Uh, we, we saw in the Twin Cities last weekend when the shortage of masks uh, was put out there uh, that People came forward and over the weekend uh, contributed 30,000 uh, medical masks. So there is this compassion. And what I think that's happening is that we are responding to our internal wells of compassion and empathy. And these are natural resources for us. They are something that we are born and that we need to claim. I've often thought that Nonviolent Peace Force, when we're in the field, the most important thing we do is to reinforce the compassion and the nonviolent nonviolence that already exists in people. And as I, I was talking with Michael Nakler yesterday and I told him I'd plagiarize, uh, when he said, you know, we don't have to invent anything. We just have to wake it up. And nonviolent that violence in its various applications, and there are many applications, including unarmed civilian protection. In the end, I believe, and I've seen it over and over again, is organized love. And our survival depends on organized, concerted nonviolence. I shudder at a vision that could be there and as Ken mentioned, nothing's automatic here. 
there could be a vision when we come through this pandemic at the other end of increased authoritarianism, of uh, mega corporations having taken on more money and more power and more merger and acquisition and more political power using that money and a broader um, uh, acceptance and reason for increasing militarization. We could look at uh, a, a country and a society that, that resembles that on the other end. On the other side, and this is wide open, we could find a country, a community, an international coming together of people who understand deeply our connectivity and the ways that we don't have to wait for government, that we can come forth to support one another and at the same time come forth collectively to de demand that government do what their purpose is and that we could come with a much stronger sense of a global beloved community. That is also a possibility and I think is something that we need to continue to focus on as we focus on our survival during uh, this crisis. So now I would like to uh, introduce my friend and my colleague and my boss, uh, someone uh, who has uh, as much or more field experience in unarmed civilian protection as anyone else in the world, Tiffany Eastham is located in Geneva, and she'll be spending a few minutes updating us on uh, our teams in the field and uh, where they're at and what they're doing to protect themselves and others. But this will be short because next week's cafe will be entirely devoted to that subject. So Tiffany, please. Great, thank you so much, Mel. And Hello to everybody. I, I wanted to echo Marna's uh, thoughts right at the beginning and just share how touching it is to see how many people are on this call and, and the, this collective sense of purpose and, and shared interest and, and, and shared love. And it's, it's, it's really meaningful. And all I keep thinking is I wish that our members of our field team were on this call so that they, they're pretty isolated where they are and where they could see this, this kind, of, kind of support and, and, and community that is being built in the way that we can manage it now. Uh, so thank you, everybody. It's really, really wonderful. So yes, as Mel said, I'll keep it relatively short and we'll go into a deeper dive on the specifics of each country next week. But I just wanted to sort of touch on sort of two major um, sort of headline topics um, of how we've been spending our time. Um, and one has really been this really rapid fire uh, set of adjustments that we've had to do over the last really two, three weeks um, as the travel restrictions were going into place, things were changing so quickly um, and the, the movement restrictions and so on and so forth and at such different paces in different locations. Our whole work is really built on, built on being able to move. Um, we have teams that are extraordinarily diverse. We have colleagues that come from 35, 40 different countries working together around the world. So that's a lot of travel, a lot of movement. Um, and what we know about our work that I often use the word intimate to describe the work of unarmed civilian protection. It's an intimate approach to violence reduction. It's about presence and accompany, accompaniment and being there in the physical space of one another. So we've had to do rapid fire pragmatic adjustments and, and operational considerations around our own teams, our own ability to function, really pragmatically, can somebody get where they're supposed to be? Um, and all of those adjustments, well, also the other big piece is figuring out, working together to figure out how do we adjust um, accordingly so that we are able to continue to serve and to be helpful and to really be paying attention to things um, as they're evolving. So on the first front, uh, we uh, have 
endless stories of people scooting around the globe just hours ahead of shutdowns. Uh, Marna and Mel were both in South Sudan. I was in Iraq. Um, you know, Marna and I certainly got out just hours before shutdowns were happening in, in our respective locations. Um, and that's just been replicated across our country programs. The immediate approach um, was to really recognize that as members of the international humanitarian community, we were going from being what we like to see as helpers and supporters of people who were at risk to be to being the potential to becoming, we became the threats. We were the ones traveling. We were the ones moving into areas that didn't yet have, have any, any virus outbreaks, such as in South Sudan. And there's a really strong sense of, we had to take a pause, take a moment, and recognize that sense of responsibility and, and, and adjust ourselves accordingly. Not only do we want to keep ourselves and our teams safe, um, but recognize that we ourselves could be carriers inadvertently and be, be bringing the virus into locations that had not yet been or not yet heavily been affected. And so our decision making has been all around that. Um, we are, it's a combination of internal decisions and then externally imposed decisions. Uh, in Iraq, for example, all land borders are closed and the airspace is closed. So our team is really constricted, really shut down. There's movement control um, in, in the locations that we are, are um, very extreme access control in, the, in where we're working. And so it's a very, we're, we're scaled down to a very small team. Uh, the Philippines and Myanmar, uh, the commercial flights are restricted, also heavy, heavy movement control. Um, and then in South Sudan, and cases in all three of those countries, and where in South Sudan we of course have no confirmed cases, uh, but commercial air traffic is closed, the land borders are closed except for cargo, um, and the, 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 the fear is pretty strong. So we've got, we've reduced um, staff where we can. We have people working from home or in physical distancing. Um, we're trying not to say social distancing, but physical distancing um, where we can and to break down, to, to be able to continue to operate while continuing to be really proactively engaged. There are broad, broad themes we need to pay attention to. In the first sort of 10 days, two weeks of the massive, just rapidly hour by hour, day by day changes in movement control, all of our energy collectively, not just NPs, but everybody's energy has been on that. And now the dust is somewhat settled and we kind of know where we are and what we can do at least for the next few weeks, perhaps a little longer. And now it's really looking at what are the trends? What are the things we need to pay attention to? As we've heard very inspirationally, uh, there's a lot of potential for, for violence to be reduced. We've seen this really concretely in Myanmar, where some of the fighting forces have just literally stopped fighting. They're more afraid of the virus than they are of, of uh, being fed by their need to be in conflict with each, uh, each other. And the fighting has stopped in some of the areas. Uh, we expect some levels of interpersonal violence, which would normally be spiking right now, such as survival sex, um, will perhaps not, we will not see those kind of spikes for fear of virus transmission. On the other hand, there's also some pretty big concerns that as, you know, if this goes on for a long period of time, people are constrained, there are fewer and fewer external eyes and people bearing witness to what's going on. Everything from the risk of intimate partner violence, domestic violence, that stress and pressure that happens in a displacement setting, and this is, this is sort of a version of that, can be increasing violence towards healthcare workers, um, and opportunistic violence and opportunities to take care of sort of local level political issues while there are fewer witnesses around. Our team in the Philippines has really raised that up as a concern uh, for them as, as what they're hearing from their communities is sort of these Rito level or clan level conflicts uh, that are old, old grievances are, are, are being continued on. So there's a whole range of things that are going on. Um, so our big work, the teams are working um, on, on sort of, we're digging deep on creativity, persistence and flexibility, which is always the name of the game for NP teams around the world and figuring out how do we maintain our presence. It's the core of what we do. Everything we do is built off of the, the fact that being present with, with people in difficult times is, is the foundation of where we start. And if we can't be present in the same way that we are, how can we be present?
So in some of the countries we work in, we've got better access to, to digital technology, there's better connectivity, staying connected by phone, so on and so forth is more possible. And in some areas, it's a little bit more cut off. And so the teams are working on setting up things like phone trees, um, messaging, monitoring, safe ways that they can move through communities more safely, negotiating access, so on and so forth. We're looking at orienting our programming, saying we work a lot on threat reduction and, and, and physical violence violence prevention and when we're thinking about the threat is physical violence it's conflict and things like our early warning early response work we have all of those tools in our in our belt you know all about being able to think about how do we see what the early warning is and what are our early responses are to protect ourselves and orienting those around um, prevention of transmission and the possible escalation of tension and violence that can happen in, in these high stress environments the teams are doing remarkably well, given the circumstances. There's sort of a wide range across the board of, of responses. And I think every day, every, we all sort of go through a whole sort of uh, a panoply of, of emotions that is from hope and, and excitement and down to, to fear. What we've really noticed from, uh, certainly from our, our expat colleagues, our international staff who are deployed around the world, is that they're very accustomed to being the ones that everybody's worried about. So the families back home are worried about them because they're deployed in difficult locations. And so they've learned how to adjust the way their energy around that, sort of knowing they're aware how safe they are and how to support their families and to let their, fam their loved ones know. And now that worry is just in all possible directions, that that, that, ex that exacerbated feeling of being separated from your loved ones is really profound. And the fear of being, being missing things, people being ill or pe people being weddings or, or birth, so on and so forth. So there's, we're doing a lot of work thinking around our own health care, our own mental health and well-being amongst each other, being a community of support together. So there's a lot going on. The important thing is, is that we're engaged. We are, 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 like always, we're very used to working in difficult circumstances. So we are working towards that. Um, we're, and our, our primary goals is balancing our two major goals, which is always true, is keeping ourselves, our team safe, and as well as being useful and contributory in the environments that we're working in. So we will continue to do that. I look forward to telling you more in more detail country by country next week. Um, and, and thanks again for everybody for being there. Thank you, Tiffany. And next week we will also have a number of people from the field who are joining us and uh, giving you firsthand accounts of what it looks like and how we adapt uh, our protection work and our presence. And uh, the teams are working on plans right now in looking at what that will look like uh, during this time of the corona crisis. So now we have uh, 20 minutes for questions or for comments. Uh, we can start out, uh, if you'd like to put them in uh, the chat box, we can go that way. And if you have something that you really want to say, you can unmute yourself and uh, share your comment verbally if you'd like to do that, uh, because we want to make sure that, that we build community here and not walls and separations. And so um, I, we're here uh, that we're building operational partnerships. And uh, it, one of the things that seemed to resonate with people is spacious solidarity uh, and that we are at this moment in spacious solidarity. So uh, would anyone like to uh, make a comment uh, or uh, ask a question or a challenge uh, in the chat box or unmute yourself and do so verbally? I'm Josine from Minneapolis. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, um, uh, I have to leave the meeting soon because I have another Zoom meeting to go on and I, I lead 12 step meetings um, on Zoom, which is I'm really grateful for. Um, but I just heard, I was trying to look it up this whole time when everyone was talking, my source, but um, that there's a call to stop um, all wars around the world. And um, some, are, some soldiers are refusing to fight because they don't want to be, um, you know, they're trying to avoid the COVID virus. So I think that's 
pretty wild that's coming out of this. And also I'm on the board of Marnita's table. And so we're four months ahead of ourselves for um, being <coughs> around the world to hold tables, to have people come together and talk about crisis. And we're doing it now on Zoom and stuff like that. Um, so the peace work is being put out there in different ways. So I, I really thank you guys for leading the way. And we see already that uh, a, a comment that Secretary General uh, Guterres not only said we had to uh, take a warlike footing in dealing with the virus, but he has also called for an end to war. I, I know there are places in Myanmar where uh, the combatants have stepped back and are not fighting because they're afraid uh, of being infected by the virus. Do other people have uh, examples of calls to end end war or uh, where people have actually stepped back. And why don't we start with, I think, Yuri, uh, you have a very specific example of what's happened in Ukraine. Uh, yes, a good day. Uh, we in Ukraine, our Ukrainian pacifist movement uh, asks our government uh, to uh, cancel uh, screen, uh, spring conscription uh, and uh, uh, later, our government uh, uh, decided uh, to postpone conscription. Uh, so, uh, not uh, uh, what we ask, uh, but uh, uh, some some results. Thank you. Uh, any other examples that people have of where they've seen or heard uh, battles ending, combatants pulling back? calls to end war. This is, uh, this is George Halverson, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is a slightly different category, but similar. In, in the healthcare world, there are a hundred organizations now who have been competitive with each other in the past, who are aligned as a coalition and are teaching each other uh, best practices, sharing information, in, in doing a whole series of things to respond more quickly to the disease or effectively to the disease and, and to work on it in the future. And, and so that um, internal competition uh, is just totally disappeared in that space right now and it's really positive. But the, the point that I wanted to make actually was the nationally and internationally, we are only going to keep this from ever happening again if we become a universal us. We have to think of us as a people for the entire world. And we have to think of us as a macrobiology for the entire world. And we have to deal with this. We should never, ever, ever let this happen again because we know the science, we know the approach, we have the information flow. And what we need to do next time this happens is, is share that information universally immediately and in target the sites and then do things on the sites to make a difference. And then universally, country to country, we need to create a sense of resource allocation and use of resource to both contain it and to support it. And we did all of that extremely badly this time. We, we did it in, in tribes. We did it in separate agendas and, and didn't share and didn't think. But that doesn't have to happen again because the artificial intelligence data sets science are all so good right now that if the next time one of these ugly viruses springs up, we are putting the right places and things in place, we can identify it immediately and then we can contain it and stop it. And so we need peace. We need peacemaking in that space. And we need peacemaking in that space so that we all think about our common and collective humanity and deal with that as opposed to being separated. Separation is deadly. But if, if we had responded to this in a peacemaking way where we actually thought of it as a universal concern that we are all going to deal with, we would not be where we are now and we should never get here again. Thanks, George. Now there was a, a question that was partially uh, answered staying on the issue of health. And uh, it, that was a, a question to Tiffany about the possibility of collecting medical resources and maybe partnering with Doctors Without Borders to offer some kind of support in the countries where we work. Tiffany, would you respond to that, please? 
Yeah, it's one of the things that we've been working on. We're looking at for partnerships and, and really concretely, for example, we've just submitted a proposal in South Sudan in partnership with another organization that is a healthcare organization for exactly this purpose. So to sort of bring together our respective expertise where we can try and bring both a protection and a, a, a peace orientation uh, towards um, prevention and response uh, where it's needed. And I see that, that Melanie has made a very interesting expansion on uh, George's uh, comments in terms of our universal being, not only being humans, uh, but all sentient beings. And I think that that's an important thing for us to keep in mind. Um, so other comments or questions that people would want to share? We've got about 15 minutes left here. Mel, could I uh, try an idea? Yeah, who is this? This is Michael Nagler. Oh, I know you. Okay, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello, Tiffany. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm thinking for the moment uh, of trying to strike a, a rhetorical position, if you will, a meme, if you will, kind of in between what you said, Mel, about how we hate the this is war uh, slogan that's being put out there and the idea of a reawakening, which, which I think is just beautiful. I'm just kind of groping for an idea here, but in terms of our approach to the general public and the media that we put out, it'd be possible to create an idea of shifting that war fever that grips so many people towards the struggle for reawakening so that you know we don't just kind of say no to that energy but we try to transform it put it into a peaceful channel and i wish i had better language for that right now but i have a feeling that this would be kind of a winning meme that if we could get behind we could uh you know, just get it out there through our, with all of our networks, there's probably millions of people out there. If we could get across this idea so that it, it takes that, you know, think of all those fighters in the bush in South Sudan with all their AK-47s over their shoulder. They are sort of psyched up for war. And how do we shift that psychic energy towards an inner struggle and a struggle for a mutual uh, compassion and awareness. Okay, thank you, Michael. And we're, we're starting to get more energy here uh, in terms <laughs> of uh, movement building and uh, how we might do that. So let's go uh, to Rachel, Rachel Julian from Leeds Be Beckett. And then from there, we'll go to Emma. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, Mel. Hi, everybody. Uh, Louder, okay. please. Is that better? Yeah, super. Um, so I'm actually in the UK, um, and in terms of coronavirus, I think we're a little ahead of you in the uh, cycle. So we are um, all uh, shut up at home, and our my uh, students doing peace studies are online. And some of the conversations we've been having um, and talking about is how uh, the the way in which people are now being shut down what what could happen so many people have been saying three months ago if we said to the world you have to stop because there's a climate emergency absolutely everybody would say that's impossible you cannot stop what's going on in the world and what we're seeing now is that uh sort of climate activists and many others are pointing out well we've stopped uh, and so I think the conversations around sort of like what is possible in the world, which we all know that dramatic change can happen very quickly. Um, many nonviolent movements have achieved that. Um, and so what is the changes that the unprecedented changes that have happened um, in so many lives now um, is seeing changes in economic and climate systems. So I think the, the one way that we're starting to talk uh, over here is to talk about, okay, it, we, 
we now know it is possible to shut down and those huge hardships, the inequalities um, that are being displayed, uh, the severe hardships uh, for those who are poorest in the UK are enormous. Um, but let's have these conversations about we understand the power of nonviolence. I articulate very much that the community building that's going on now, the way that people are caring within communities is a nonviolent act. It's the way in which we are together uh, is part of nonviolence. So we're seeing that in communities, even if people uh, don't yet know that that's the, the, the language that we might use. And so to have those conversations about communities, climate activists have talked about the need for community activism for decades, uh, transition movements and such. So actually, this is a really good moment to be bringing those together. And actually, I, I do think that the, the, new, the new movement which will emerge is something that we haven't yet seen. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel. And let's, we, we have a number of comments here on movement building. Let's go to Emma and then go to Agnes and keep our comments to a couple of minutes. We're uh, coming up on nine minutes left to our conversation today. So please. Emma, are you? Uh, yes, with I, I actually hadn't intended to speak, but since I have the opportunity, I find all of this very hopeful. And I, I really see this as a way, this is a means to the actual, the, finally the transformation of our world and the way we do business and leaving business as usual. I'm seeing many, many people step up to help and, and with people who are participating in this in this meeting and other meetings in which I participated. And I, I, despite all the fear, I really work at focusing on the positive and releasing fear and releasing anger and, and focusing on healing and, and um, solidarity and oneness. And I think that's the way we're gonna do it. As the last speaker said, transformation, transformation can happen very, very quickly if we have enough people who are focusing on that versus fear and 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 negativity and so thank you for this meeting thank you emma and agnes from extinct extinction Re rebellion agnes are you with us okay i see that my brother david hartso has a comment he'd like to make <clears throat> david um, it's wonderful to see everybody and to feel this uh, beloved community here. Um, I guess my question would be um, whether the Nonviolent Peace Force and Doctors Without Borders, <clears throat> uh, the people in the religious community around the world, all the groups that are actually working in conflict areas and are living in those conflict areas, could echo the Secretary General's call for ending war and ending the fighting and ending the economic sanctions to allow the whole world to put their focus on uh, stopping this virus and, uh, and building the beloved community. Uh, it's it's a, a, a tremendous opportunity to do what uh, Ken is uh, suggesting in his article that we uh, move from this way of uh, competing with one another, uh, bombing each other, uh, threatening each other to really uh, finding our and building the uh, foundation for a really, uh, as I said, beloved community. Okay, thanks, David. And we're uh, coming up to the end, but let's hear from Melanie quickly and then Nevin. Melanie Green. Hi. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to say just very briefly about the oneness. We, um, you were saying this is war is the message that's being touted everywhere. And for me, uh, I, it, took, it feels like it took forever for this to happen, but it was inevitable at the rate that we have been consuming and especially the, our, our consumption of other beings has created this inevitability. It has happened repeatedly. And I think it's important for us to point to, this is oneness. This is our message of oneness, not war. Um, and I, I think this is a great opportunity to talk about 
connection rather than separation. So just wanted to say that. Thank you for doing Thank you, this. Melanie. And we'll go to Nevin. And I do see that we do have Agnes with us. So Agnes will have the last uh, comment before the wrap up. So Nevin, please. Oh, um, th thank you and congratulations on getting so many people together. How do we get um, Ken's article published in the New York Times or something and Ken, Mel, Tiffany and others on Rachel Maddow, Morning Joe, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks and hello to everybody. It, it is ironic that all the experts that come on uh, are uh, either active military or former military who still have contracts with military uh, weapons producers. So let's uh, go to Agnes and then we're going to have to close. Okay, hello, do you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, just a few because uh, I'm just new in the in Extinction Rebellion movement, so I didn't want to, to raise uh, like a lot of argument, but just uh, the link between nonviolence and the um, environmental movement, I think it's very important. Um, extinction Rebellion or not. Uh, but yes, I think we can like uh, link um, both of them. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we will come back together uh, in the second Nonviolence Cafe, which will be at uh, 1500 UTC next Thursday, which is uh, the same time as today, 10 o'clock uh, Central Daylight Time in the United States. Uh, and at that time, we will go much more deeply into what's happening in the field and some of these questions that people are raising about how we connect together with MSF, with other groups, and how we really have to change and adapt our work to fit this crisis. And we will face harder times. Uh, there will be more death. There will be more fear. There will be more violence. Uh, and that will be here. And so it's so important that we continue to come together as communities to share and to strategize uh, and to focus on themes like imagining that this is a time of oneness where we have space, spacious solidarity and that we shift our struggle away from war to a struggle for reawakening. So thank you everyone for this time together and we look forward to seeing and hearing from you uh, next week at the same time and we will get you the Zoom link. Good day, everybody. Everybody, bye-bye. Bye everybody, thanks so much. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Be well. Thank you. Be, well. be safe, be healthy. I'm so Hi, glad you got a negative you. diagnosis, Mel. Hi, Rachel. Nice to meet you. Hi. You can look at the chat box and um, complete the survey. It's a short survey. It would help us in future calls. So take just a few minutes to do that. You'll find the survey in the chat box. And uh, we want to hear from you. We want to improve. We want to meet your needs. So help us be better and let us know what your thoughts are. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Mel and everyone. It was wonderful. Bye-bye. Bye. May all beings be well. Bye.